Good evening, and welcome to another Northshire Presents virtual event. My name is David Wood. I'm the events manager at Northshire's uh, Manchester, Vermont location. Um, it is a few quick things before we get started. If you have any questions for our authors tonight, please type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I'll save those up and pose them for you at the end of tonight's event. And secondly, uh, just a note of thanks. Um, independent bookselling is hard in the best of times. And um, we are still around because of your continued support. And we, um, we all really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to welcome to our screens, Jocelyn Nicole Johnson, author of the acclaimed book, My Monticello, a fiction debut that was called a masterly feat by the New York Times. It's placed third on Time Magazine's test 10 best books of the year. It won the Weatherford Award, the Lillian Smith's Prize, the Balcones Prize, and was finalist for many, many others, including a National Book Critics Circle Award, a Penn Faulkner Award, and an LA Times Book Award. Johnson's been a fellow at Tin House, Hedgebrook, and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. Her writing appears in Guernica, The Guardian, and elsewhere. Her short story, Control Negro, was anthologized in the Best American Short Stories 2018, which was guest edited by Roxane Gay and read live by LeVar Burton. Colson Whitehead calls my Monticello a badass debut by any measure, nimble, knowing, and electrifying. While Roxanne Gay says absolutely unforgettable, Johnson's prose soars to new heights. Our uh, guest on this program once before, Mega Majumdar, said that My Monticello is a magnificent debut that holds so much in its gaze. Great love and great oppression. Tremendous individual courage and systemic racism futures of joyful justice, and futures of extremism. This breathtaking, artful book is a gift. And we are lucky to be joined tonight by my friend Ricardo Wilson, author of An Apparent Horizon and Other Stories, a Northshire bookstore uh, staff pick, and The Nigrescent Beyond. He is an assistant professor of English at Williams College and the director of Outpost, a residency for creative writers of color from the United States and Latin America, just south of us in Vermont. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Ricardo Wilson and Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. That was that was so nice. I feel like that you were talking about someone else. That was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> David made me feel very insecure. I need to <clears throat> I need to work on my voice. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's certainly Jocelyn. It is an absolute pleasure to meet you in this context. Um, was excited to read your book um, when I heard it's coming out. And then when Dafit obviously reached out for this, it was a no brainer. So thank you for taking the time to talk with, with me and with, with my corner of Southern Vermont today. Thank you. As I said before, it's, it's really kind of you to read and to ask questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no. So I have like the voice of my students in my head. So I am, I am, I was actually low key in the parlance of, of my students, low key traumatized on some levels. We have a lot in common. <laughs> so, uh, I'm you know, living in, in Southern Vermont right now, but I actually, um, I was a professor. My first gig after my postdoc was at, um, at Washington and Lee, about 50 minutes away from you. Um, and we landed there uh, the summer when Charlottesville happened, right? And, and there was a lot of disappointment in terms of my own university and how, how stuff was kind of handled there. And so those, reading this took me back to kind of a lot of, a lot of places and which was enjoyable. I thought about, caught up with a lot of pieces of me um, that I kind of tucked away um, as I fled north. Um, <laughs> but I want to start by just asking about the, I mean, about the collection, you and I, but my apparent horizon is also a collection of novellas and stories. And I'm always just curious about kind of order of operations. I mean, for the folks on the call, the folks will be tuning in on YouTube, um, kind of the story of Control Negro and kind of how that catapulted you in many ways is, is quite famous. I mean, you can repeat that a little bit, but I'm, I'm interested in kind of how the stories developed, when you imagined this as a collection, um, and which stories sharpened the others and, and vice versa. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about how I even knew I was writing a collection, how it came to be, and then I'll read a tiny bit from the novella just to give a feel for what it sounds like. Um, so yeah, so I've been writing a really long time. This is my debut, but I've been writing and working on stories, and I've just been kind of writing stories without a sense of a collection. And at some point I wrote a story called Virginia is not your home. And I thought maybe this, these stories are connected. Maybe there's a way in which these stories um, that I'm writing are talking about some of the same things, talking about this idea of 
home and belonging and um and that story in particular it made me think about the ways so I was born and bred in Virginia uh, yeah. but my whole family is from the south my parents kind of came including my my older brother all were born in South Carolina where all my cousins live where my you know aunties uncles grandma lived um and so I was kind of first generation of Virginia. And so there's these ways in which Virginia feels very much like home to me yeah. and the ways in which it, it doesn't so much. So I, I kind of realized I was thinking about this idea of home um, as nation and home as community and kind of this complicated and dual sense of home. And so I kind of had one story I'd already written that really ended up in the collection. I had a, some stories that didn't end up in the collection, yeah. but I had one story I'd already written. And then I started continuing to write towards it. And when I wrote Control Negro, which was probably the third story I wrote in the collection. Um, that story sharpened and galvanized uh, and just was a more, hmm, how would I say it? It was kind of a little bit ripped from the headlines. I know they say don't rip from the headlines, but it, I was responding to something we saw that I saw in the actual world at University yeah. of Virginia, yeah. um, a, a black student being bloodied by officers and, you know, kind of, creating this news, this kind of flashpoint where people were thinking about what it means to be policed in your university and where someone's safe. And so the energy of that helped me to get, you know, an agent and so forth. But I'd already kind of decided that I was making this project of these, these stories about really different Virginians, Black Virginians in different parts of the state that I knew a little bit better and thinking about this idea of home and belonging. And then I wrote forward from there. So the other stories, um, Buying a House Ahead of the Apocalypse, Something Sweet on Our Tongues, those came afterward. And then I wrote the novella last. Wow, yeah. Um, and yeah. so one thing about writing the novella was because I'd written all the other stories, at least they were in strong draft forms. I ended up pulling all these sentences and ideas from other stories. So um, one, one line in the novella is uh, about thinking about Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia um, and how black people who, even if you were freed in Virginia at that time, at some point when he was freeing his black children, mm -hmm you could be rearrested if you didn't leave the state. And yep. so I repurposed that title, Virginia is not your home yeah. from a story that talks about something very, very different to say, to talk about this thing in history. So I kind of, the novella, because it was last, I got to pull these little threads and to echo these ideas from the other stories in it. Yeah, no, I love this, this notion of echoing. I mean, it is a dynamic collection and how they speak so it's, it's it's interesting to hear you say that and i'll say the rip from the headlines piece is also interesting because it's um and I, we'll get into some of the formal choice you know without for the for the for the viewers and listeners kind of around here without giving too much away um maybe how you get into this formally but it's just i was just so taken by how present and kind of everlasting the meditations were in this book and so kudos to you because that is like quite 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 tough to to pull off and you do it beautifully um and for me especially in my in my monticello did you know that was a novella from the beginning was there no i kind of um <laughs> it's funny because i slipped that question in there but yeah <laughs> no please ask whatever wherever it goes i'm totally good with it um so the novella you know, I really love short, I do really love short stories and I've loved them since I was a teenager. I actually went to the University of Virginia used to host Young Writers Workshop and I took like, a, this was a while ago. <laughs> I took a micro fiction class when I was like in, in, in high school there. And it was like my first workshop experience. And it was just about creating almost like a story and a page and pulling out every fragment of a word and every comma you didn't need and having it be really dense. And I think that forever shaped my aesthetic towards writing. Not to mention the fact that I wrote this book roughly between 2015 and 2020 when I was teaching full time. Yep. And so I have to say, even though I've written longer things, I've written a novel before, I feel more, it's easier for me. I really want to get, stay in the moment of writing something. And it's hard to do that when you're teaching full time and you have you know, your family responsibilities. For me, it's hard. I'm yeah. sure people do it all the time. For me, it was difficult. Amen. And so and so it was nice to be able to draft something in a summer or get at least get a draft out, even if I was going to work on it, 
you know, for a year and come back to it and think about it and have my writer group read it. Um, but just to have like kind of the full first intention. And I think that's a lot harder with a novel for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think the novella started off as like just a long short story. And I just kept saying, it just needs a little more middle. Like I kind of had a beginning and an end and I knew I needed to figure out a whole bunch of stuff in the middle. So I didn't even, even now, you know, in the, in the UK, it's published on its own as a novel or a novella. I mean, yeah. what's, you know, I, I'm interested what you think the difference is. Cause for me, I do think there's some aesthetic things that feel like a short story in it. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's a slightly arbitrary, like there's just the number of words, you know, there's long novels that could have, you know, what does that mean? No, absolutely. I mean, in part of my where I work on Mexico and the United States. And so, you know, in the Latin American market, um, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but you find short, a novel is novella, but like you, you find short novels or fiction around that word length all the time. But like, I think from a publishing perspective here in the States, there's just such an allergy to it, um, which yeah. for me is, um, horrifying maybe too strong but just really disappointing because i think there's this gets back to like what is possible in that form and i think you do it expertly here in my monticello i mean i think there's and it's it's not funny but interesting to hear you talk about um this kind of flash fiction course that really kind of like got you th thinking in many ways in terms of your and i think this word gets overused often but like the poetic nature of your own short stories right and you can certainly see that working there but there's a Similarly, at the form of the novella, I mean, there's a compactness that's possible. There's a thickness that's possible. I think one of the things that I'm really drawn to about your work is how you push against notions of resolution. And I think because, especially in the U.S. market, um, we are so, so, so much less conditioned um, as to what to expect in a novella versus a novel, I think there's room for experimentation. Um, and buy in from a reader that, that you see. I mean, John Keane is one of my favorite writers and I think you're you're able to, you know, he inhabits, I think that form quite well. Um, so on that note, like before we kind of get into the granular, I would love to hear you talk about kind of what writers undergird this project for, for you. I mean, I was talking with David earlier before we got on on some work that I'm doing on Hughes now. Um, and I think his, his fiction is underread but his humor, I'm not sure if you've read The Ways of White Folk, but his his humor in that collection resonated a lot with with your work, especially Control Negro and 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 what so I'm just curious to hear kind of and obviously this is a long project for you, you've been writing for a long time, but what are who are the kind of most important folks to you for various reasons? Yeah. So it's so funny because what you read so affects how you write. And I kind of read all over the place <laughs> i'm kind of all over the place in my reading so there's definitely traditional like people that you hear a ton that are just were really formative for me like tony morrison it feels cliche to say but for sure i remember reading beloved um i think my first year in college and going and seeing microfiche of her speaking about the bit and i just remember being in the yeah. library and going oh wow this is and I, well, it's funny because even that particular book, which was the first Morrison book I read, um, taking something, I think she was inspired from a newspaper clipping, right, of, of this story and then like turning the story inside out. So I think that is something I'm constantly thinking about when you, you know, there are two stories in this collection that are really reacting to historical things. They happen to be things that happened here in Charlottesville where I live but taking something where you're seeing it from perspective and then kind of like having this very, something obscene <laughs> really in both cases, an act yeah. of violence, an act of um, nativism and yeah. aggressive racial performance and trying to get around it and figure it out and feel people within it. So, um, and having these really um, complicated interactions with it, I think, always really appeals to me. Yeah. Um, writers like Richard Wright, that line of like, I remember reading Black Boy, my parents had it on their, their shelves when I was a kid. And just this kind of going into these poetics, it was the blah, 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 blades of crap. Like, I just yeah. remember saying, oh, that totally is interesting to me. Like having this narrative, this almost like memoir, like narrative, but then having this, these moments of flight that just show you the internal, I think I'm really interested in the internal world of readers and I'm often um 
my partner laughs because I write, I, he's like, you write a lot of stories and nothing happens, but it's all like the internal things that happen. And then when I wrote the novella, he was like, there's things happening. I'm, really, there's a lot happening. I'm excited about that. Um, I definitely read a ton of Octavia Butler. Interesting. Um, and just, you know, I literary uh, fiction is definitely my, probably my, my main genre, but I like when people kind of use other genres to think about some of the things that literary fiction might think about or just that intrusion of different genres I think she's like a master of using Absolutely, fiction yeah. to think about race and gender and everything and there's alien there's all the things but there always feels like there's this intelligence of talking about what we're doing yeah um, there's a writer I really love named Charles Yu um, he won the National Book Award for Interior Chinatown but I really yeah. loved his his first novel which was um how to live safely in a science fictional world and he's thinking about like the immigrant experience it has a very literary feel there's an attention to language but then it also has like time travel I mean it just has this yeah. other element that's in relation to all that but it's getting at things that feel like what memory means and what it means to be a person out of place like his his you know the character in the story is a father who is thinking who's building a time machine in their garage and they're like an immigrant who's outside of this American promise. Yeah. It's just really like, I yeah. love that. There's so much you can do with it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's interesting for me, the, the novella in particular. And so to hear you talk about Butler and genre read as an, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but it read kind of as an inversion of the zombie genre. Um, and, and then of course brought to mind white and white has obviously blurbed your work which is incredible but right it brought to mind his zone one which lines up with i think everything you're talking about kind of what is possible when you inhabit these genres so did like i'll back out in a minute but as like on the topic of my monticello like how like how when did your investment in kind of a post-apocalyptic genre Ha happen or cross your mind as you started forming or was that there from the beginning of like this allows me to get some kind of temporal distance from this kind of this moment that takes place in Charlottesville or was that is that just how it came out it's it's funny because so the novella is this near I call it dystopian light it's near future yeah. Yeah. um group you know there's kind of this idea of this unraveling yeah. of things falling apart and then this inciting action is this group of men who come under the banner of white supremacy and rouse these neighbors out of their house and they have to flee to Monticello. So, or they end up fleeing to Thomas Jefferson's plantation home, which is 10 minutes from where I'm sitting right now, very close, um, and take refuge there. Um, the it's funny that you say zombie because I remember really early on when I was working on this, saying to someone like in a bar, like I'm writing a book and it's the the zombies are the white supremacists, you know, and, you know, like, they're on the, you know, they're at the bottom of the hill. And and I, I actually really like zombie films because they're always about the human condition. And and I think this story <clears throat> isn't so much about the zombies at the bottom of the hill. It's about what do we do in response to that? Because a big question I had, um, it's probably not a surprise to many readers that this was, uh, that novella was a reaction to August. We talked about August uh, 11th and 12th, 2017 here in Charlottesville where I live, where we, were the unwitting host to the Unite the Right rally, where um, kind of people converge from all the, over the country, ostensibly to, in defense of the Confederate statue that was being discussed, being taken down, but really came with uh, with torches and with banners, with swastikas on them, and with machine guns in this extremely aggressive way that was incredibly disturbing and then there was just all this violence and someone was killed and so forth um so when i was writing this novella about a year later and think it was me thinking about all those things and i basically wrote like thinking of butler i didn't realize this till later but she yeah. wrote an essay called no, um roles for predicting the future but i was kind of thinking like what would happen if this energy went unchecked how will the world look if we can don't take care of our infrastructure. If we, if we let this kind of violent racist energy and this idea of almost like conquest 
over a place and claiming of it in the night um, if we let this go unchecked and also our environment, you know, kind of the climate piece too. So I didn't really have to imagine a dystopia. Yeah. I really, really, really grounded it in every single thing that I was thinking about that was extremely, um, I don't know, it's just very grounded in what happened. All the details of the story yeah. took from a, from that weekend, really. I mean, even the, the fact that planes don't fly, we had like a helicopter crash, yeah. one of the police helicopters crashed during there. So that's what got my mind to thinking about that, to think about, um, you know, first, almost all the details are just taken, they're just lifted. So yeah. they're not really fantasy. They're not yeah. really, the future is, yeah. is right here. It's just a look back. It's just a technique to give me a tiny bit of distance or give us a distance. And it's just slightly pushed into the future. Yeah, no, it's, and so my son was born on August 12th, the year before. And so we were unpacking boxes in Lexington, Lexington Virginia when, you know, when all that um, unraveled, which I definitely want to get to. Um, but for me, I mean, one of the joys of like having conversations like this, it forces you to kind of read things more closely. We start the collection, so this isn't giving anything away, but the first line, by the time you read this, you may have figured it out. And we end the novella again, not giving too much away. Similarly, kind of dwelling in the might and may, for lack of a better word. And this is kind of what I was referring to, where where um, you um, kind of push against resolution, and I think really like productive ways. But I'd love I don't want to fill your mouth with any words. I'd love just to like is that resonance on purpose? between the, the start and the beginning, it feels like you leave a lot of, for everything you just said about these very real life events, it feels like you leave a lot of space um, for the reader to kind of situate themselves into that, but just your approach to the might and may of it all. Yeah. That makes, I, if that makes any sense, but I mean, it's just that struck, makes, it yeah. makes all the sense in the world. I think that I had not, I definitely had thought about it with the end of the book and where the book ended. Yeah. I love that you pointed out. One thing I learned is that even though you wrote a book, yeah. people will tell you things about it all the time that you didn't <laughs> notice, which is kind of incredible and wonderful. And I think that's what, that's just true. You know, I taught art to little kids, to elementary school children for a long time. And the pleasure of making something is for someone to come do it and say, this is what I see in what you made. Someone who's paying attention and who's using, who has care for it, right? right? Even if whatever that comment is, right? Yeah. Kids love that. Like when you actually take what they made earnestly and seriously yeah. and think about it and yeah. people love that and when they do it to one another. And anyway, so I hadn't thought about that, but yes, that's so it's very to, on my brand. Like it's just how I think about the world, you know? Yeah. There's always this space. There's always this and this or complicating this or complicating that and that idea of what might happen or the future or what may happen was really intentional because um and I I do think that's the biggest convention in the novella that is different than a no novel whatever those things mean yep. I think short stories often end on an image or an idea or a feeling without resolving every thread and pulling together and the hero wins and so forth and so I think for me very intentionally, the way I wanted to think about the novella was how might we respond to yeah. these kinds of forces? What does it mean? And I wanted to leave it to the reader to, to have the last action because, yeah. you know, we know that this novella, you know, pits this group of neighbors up on the hill I would say against, but in contrast yeah. to these, yeah. the zombie white supremacists mm -hmm. down with their torches mm -hmm. coming up. And so what's gonna, how that battle's gonna end is largely up to us, mm -hmm. um, to the readers, right? It would be, I think, silly. I've said yeah. it before, but I really do think it would be silly to have the heroes win and white supremacists ends and we close the book and everything is great and we go on with our day. I think it makes much more sense to think about um, what do these things mean in the actual real, to leave us thinking about these characters as a symbol for how do we want to be in the world and what yeah. do these things mean in the actual yeah. world? It sticks with you. So you've done your work there. I mean, it certainly sticks with you. Um, you can tell folks listening, like I am drawn to, to the collection, but certainly to the novella. Do we have time for you to maybe read a small portion of it for yeah, us? Yeah, I will read a little bit. Um, 
I think I'm going to read. I, I often read that first, the first paragraph, but I'm going to, I think I'm just going to read just a little, just a page or two in. Um, okay. And again, we have, <laughs> we have a character, Danasia Love, who's speaking from Monticello, and she's describing how they got there and describing their days on the mountain. She's describing that first day when these people come into their neighborhood violently and start setting fire to homes and she's forced to flee in this small bus with the group of people, her grandmother, her boyfriend, uh, her white boyfriend, her mostly black neighbors, and just a mix of people. That was the night we came and claimed this place, if not first exactly, then first since this dark new unraveling when everything's been set free again, at least the way I see it. Not to mention our original due, denied, dismissed, but still there teeming in our blood, at least in my violets and in mine. The men came with the men with fire came in the wake of great and terrible storms that felled historic trees and flooded city hall. They came after the power failed us and our phones went glitchy and dark in our palms. In those moments just after our cells all crash, I witness a jet and a, and a, and a hospital helicopter both plunge from a rainless April sky. It was unclear if we were under siege or whether the world was toppling under its own needless weight. In those surreal and collapsing weeks, brazen hordes of students refused to leave our university. Some threw rain-soaked keggers right on grounds. Others held demonstrations, outraged that their futures had been, futures had been waylaid, whatever the cause. For weeks, I remained on grounds too, an act of desperation or resolve. My transfer and tuition paid represented so much sacrifice and effort and not solely mine. By then I'd moved in with Knox in his rustic but prestigious dorm room bordering the lawn. I'd leave only briefly every handful of days to check on my Violet, my mama's mama who just about raised me. My Violet lived a few miles away in one of our towns clustered of public assisted housing. But after my last visit, when I tried to return to campus, whole sections had been barricaded. A crew of young men, their faces streaked in our school colors, hounded me off, shouting and spitting, shoving me back. But I'm a UVA student, I told them. My things are inside. Knox was waiting inside that perimeter too, wholly unaware, I later learned, of how quickly things were devolving outside his closed door. Later, when I told Knox that our classmates had barred me, his gaze drifted as if he could not quite believe them or else it, which may have meant me. The important thing was he'd come and found me at my Violet's house after I had not been able to return. That was fantastic. Um, you pointed this out, so I'll just like lightly mention it and then we can move on. But I, I just really appreciate um, the intersection between like meditations on race, particularly blackness and the environment, how it, how you're able to pull that off. Kind of, they just live in the same space. Um, it doesn't feel forced at all. Um, and so that the notion, how the notion of environment kind of carries throughout and the, the various crises, I, I don't know, it's just, it was, it was, it was quite remarkable what I want to sit with unraveling right so we get this quite early on that this moment is referred to it to it as that and for me <clears throat> um there's a certain kind of somber may not be the right word right but like there's um you you one doesn't just ravel back right i mean there's in the raveling back there's you know you have that kind of loose ball of collected string for lack of a better word um that while useful is something different right and i think that's what your work pushes to but i'm just curious about when was that 
was it always the unraveling from the beginning? How did you arrive at that when you were struggling with how to create some distance, how to kind of name this? How did that terminology come come to being? Yeah, I um, I wish I had a really fun story to say why, but sometimes a word comes to you and it's the right word. So that word did come to me early. And I think when you're trying to, I'm not a generally a world builder. I write things about the world and this is about the world, but you know, because I'm creating something that doesn't exist, this unraveling, like there's so much power in just naming something. Like you, if you just just say that, then people know it's a whole thing that you don't have to describe everything about it. They know that, and, and that for me, that word held, I think, sadly, like kind yeah. of this, this truth of what I see my parents uh, witness, which is something that's been so painstakingly and carefully pieced together and woven together and pulled together from a lot of sacrifice and difficulty, seeing it kind of being yeah. tugged at and tugged at until there's this kind of uh, moment of kind of uh this crucial moment where it's just like being pulled apart and it's never gonna it's not gonna go back you're not gonna just be able to tuck those strings back in it's gonna be falling apart and I think as far as their idea of not America's actual policy towards black people because they had a lot of experience that was difficult in that but just this idea that we were going to try to keep working towards it being slightly better or at least we were going to say this is who we are you know, watching that for a lack of a better term, term unravel or fall apart in some ways, not entirely because there's, yeah. it is really disheartening to them. So, you know, there's something about that word that just feels like yeah. sad, <laughs> like, yeah. you, know, yeah. um, this, you know, something was, care was put to put this together this way. And now it's, it's falling apart and it's kind of reached this crucial point. So I just kind of came to that term and it, it worked and I, and I, and I left it in there. Um, I also want to say one more thing about that reading. It reminded me one of the things I ended up doing in the novella was trying to recreate in my own imagination um, moments from other times. So when this character, Danasia, goes to her university from her grandmother's house and tries to get back in and she's barred as if she doesn't belong there. It was me thinking about, you know, here in Charlottesville, massive resistance where schools were shuttered to black students and people coming yeah. up to what should be their school and being barred or just that moment of, you know, the images you see of people yelling at someone, you know, school ch- child coming up the steps kind of situation. And so uh, part of the project was for me to take some of those moments and try to make them feel intimate to me and make them feel like they exist in this time. Cause there's a way in which you can kind of flatten it to a moment in the past, but when you're with a character, hopefully you can feel it a bit more. Yeah, no, there's a circularity. It just like another kind of like more craft, not craft, but just um, as you were approaching this and you talked about this in the opening, um, decision to keep violence relatively kind of off the page, was that, you knew that from the beginning and and this was, this was kind of forcing a more, uh, um, a meditation on the mundane um, in more ways, or was that, what was that decision? I mean, or was it not a decision? Was it an intuition? I think that, I mean, there, for me, this is like, this is a lot of violence for me yeah. 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 <laughs> because, you know, we do start with images of people being yeah. hurt yeah. and we, we yeah. see, you know, that's the beginning of the story. And then, you know, we have a reprieve and we definitely have this play, like, you know, yeah. there's but then it kind of comes back and we see not only just violence in the moment, but we see the result of violence. Like yeah. later when a character comes up now and we see what that would look like. Yeah. Um, so for me, this is a lot of violence, but yeah. I think that I'm not, one of the projects too was to, I've said this earlier and I kind of just realized that after I wrote it is that I wanted to hide a little utopia in this apocalypse. And so, um, and I, and I didn't know I was doing that, but I think I had to do that. <laughs> to, to uh, yeah, that that's what, that's funny. I have a note that says like utopia lurks in this dystopia, like as I was right, so, uh-uh, yeah. really? Oh, that's so yeah. wonderful. How yeah. So I think that I wanted to think, again, I was thinking, how do I respond to this obscenity of yeah. United Right and to this movement? Yeah. How do I respond to that? And so 
the way so my characters were trying to respond to that right they are yeah. literally refugees out of their homes so they're yeah. thinking what is our community going to look like that's different than the force that's coming for us and so yeah. their 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 community and has all you know it has has this huge feminine power there's these female leaders in it there's an emphasis on growing things so you have the garden you have all these ages of wisdom you have even the men who are there there's just compared to most stories of violence and conflict there is a, a an attention a care and a focus on women yeah. and and on the on feminine power so that yeah. was one the voices of brown and black people being valued and them having and those characters having something they can show us and tell us about this america, american idea the promise of america that's different because they've been in some ways excluded from it yeah. was important to me um so i think because i was focusing on those things it it takes some of the space away from like a huge battle scene, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it structures it. I mean, that was not what I was getting at, but yeah, like absolutely. But this again, focus, like you said, on the on the the result. And I would add to that for those who are listening, that kind of the attention to the intergenerational conversations, I think, is also um, quite fascinating. Before we open up to Q and A, I've like kind of you know, for me, um, young black kid growing up in L.A. Um, you know, folks, my family's from, from, from Panama and, you know, and, and, and comes to States. And it really isn't until living in Lexington, Virginia, you know, uh, you know, after a PhD, which centers a lot on black studies where, um, you know, I first make it to a plantation for lack of a better word. Um, and I just remember being struck um, I actually took a class there for for you know to a, to a plantation turned wedding venue for a class on neo slave narratives right which was just um, felt like a good idea on some levels and was you know on, I mean it was it was, we made it work and it was great but I just remember being so struck by the distance between the quarters for the enslaved um, and it was just one of those things like no matter how many times you you know you read these things or. Uh, you know, see movies or whatever it may be. Um, I, I to this day just just the, the distance and everything um, that that signified for me is just as like kind of stuck with me. And so, just think about your own. And I felt that you know on the Mulberry Road and the you know and the the, the, the conversation that goes. I think you painted that well, but I don't I don't want to push you in that direction. But you know, family from South Carolina. You you know born and raised in Northern Virginia, right? And and with a proximity to the South that's much closer than my you know that my, than mine was. Um, even still, was there anything in this kind of writing and thinking process that research process that surprised you, um, and 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 ended up shaping things you know sh shaping approaches in any kind of way, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. No, I'm I'm surprised all the. I mean, I think this also came out of. So yes, yes, there are things that surprise me. And I think it's the experience of going to Monticello, living here, I've gone here multiple times for various reasons, including with my my whole black family, like family reunion, like with the matching shirts, like we went to Monticello. At any rate, um, there's this way in which going up there is super confrontational. It's just, it's like, it's, it's lovely space. It's been so preserved. It's it's gorgeous in a lot of ways. Jefferson, you know, there's all this emphasis on the brilliance of this person. And then they're, and then you're like, and they're like, this is where the little black boys made nails. And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. what is said, what isn't says everything about it and watching the story change too. The story has changed at Monticello. Yeah. When you go there now, no matter what tour you take, there's going to be more emphasis on enslaved people than there was when I went there 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, but what I noticed was in the year after August, 12th, before I really started writing this, um, 2017 to 2018, I went to all these events about Black communities in Charlottesville, because our town was attending to that, and like there were all these things presented. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up learning was just the actual data. It's like those details that you, you know things, but you don't know things. Mm -hmm. So you know, I knew that enslaved people had built a lot of UVA, but I didn't know that people brought their slaves to UVA like a student, like a white male student had a slave there. I just didn't know that. Or 
Yeah. I, I didn't know that like graveyards were segregated. Like, of course they were. Yes, of course. But I just hadn't thought about all these ways, all these, you know, that just the material of how things are, it feels so different. And like all the spaces that not just here, there's nothing particularly special about Monticello. I mean, yes, there is, but it's true for just the downtown mall. If you go into Paramount Theater, where people sat, how, you know, not so long ago, people who live now can tell you. And it's just, I think that there's this like haunting that we have and it would be fine. There's ghosts everywhere, except for there's this denial of the haunting too. And this, this inability to like communicate. And I think that this made me think about it and bring to life that idea of those ghosts and kind of try to have them for lack of a better word, just, you know, I wanted this reconciliation. I wanted the fantasy of and the dream yeah. of this character who's an imagined descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. I wanted her to be able to reckon with this in, the, in this way that might be productive in order to get to that utopia. And so I don't know if I answered your question, but that's- Oh, no, absolutely. I yeah, no, I just appreciate the detail and the attention. Um, an absolutely beautiful book. Um, let's move to the audience. Yeah. Uh, thank you both so much. This has been yeah. fantastic this evening. Um, yes, please, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat or in the Q&A box, and I'll be happy to pose them for you. Um, but jo Jocelyn, I've got a question for you. Um, tell me, is a little bit about your writing process. Is there something that, um, you know, you, what was the best thing that didn't make it into the book? Oh my gosh. Well, I put, a, you know, I'm, what I'm really excited about is when I went to go sell this book or when my agent and I went out we were like we could do the novella by itself we could put it all together and we ended up putting it all together how we thought it should look but we kind of went to editors and said what do you see in this book and what was so wonderful was that nine out of ten of them and weirdly I think all the women editors that looked at it wanted them together which I thought was really amazing because um the novel for a for, for an unknown writer as i as i was definitely going into this um novellas and short stories are non-starters and then you put them together and then that's just weird like that doesn't even make any kind of sense and the fact that people understood that they were in converse could be in conversation with each other made me really happy so i had other stories i didn't make it in here but what i'm more excited about is that this combination was allowed to be published and, you know, I think I'm hoping I've seen a lot more short stories kind of be out on lists and be really visible story collections, but I hope it becomes a more normal thing because I actually think it fits our reading right now. I think people, myself included, were so distracted for attention and the way our attention spans are working. I think stories can be really nice because you are in the world of the mind of somebody, um, but it's in these bits that can be a little bit more. Um, manageable time-wise, but still are in conversation with one another. So you're getting kind of a deeper thing than if you just read, some, you know, a paragraph here and a TikTok there, you know, there's something about it. It has both. It has that connection to each other and also this brevity in this space. So, so yeah. Thank you. I, I think I have, I, I think I'm witnessing at the bookstore a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a growingness of the of the short story. It seems to be selling better and um, seems to be more successful uh, than it was in the past. You know, the, the sort of the inherited logic was short stories don't do well, but um, I think it's been changing in the last few years. And I think you're right about our attention spans. Um, Thanks, do you yeah. want me to read a tiny bit from another story just for- Please, that would be wonderful. Just for- one thing I also love about um, short stories and this collection, I did this, is that you can have really different point of views. So I have like really different characters. One story is in the form of a letter from a father to a son. One story is in the form of a list, which I'm the queen of lists. I love a list, a good list, a good complicated list with a post-it on it and then another list on that. <laughs> um, you know, and the story I'm gonna read is the title of this collection used to be Virginia is not your home. So I'm just going to read a paragraph or two from, from that one. And it's in, you know, second person you, it's like someone telling themselves, someone who's really dissatisfied with, with their name, where they're from, this idea of longing. In college, I knew people were just like, call me Rusty now. Like they just changed their name one day and you just had to like go with it or you didn't have to, but you just did. It was, so I, I'm always fascinated by that desire to want to 
change. Virginia is not your home. They hung that name on you at birth, but Virginia was never your home. Read Nausea by Sartre and give yourself a new one. Trumpet your new name to the liver spotted washroom mirror like a coronation. Gape your mouth then angle your tongue behind your teeth. While you're at it, work to remedy those other afflictions that fetid high hill R that has planted itself in the middle of words like wash. Scrub the stink of manure from your clothing. And while your young body churns over the basin, keep whispering your new still secret name. Believe that if you can just change this, you can change everything. I'll stop there. But yeah, so just really different. I love that about story collections, especially when you, you know, writing about, in, my, in this case, it's all black characters, but they're super different from each other. And I think that sometimes um, in a terrible way, people expect one story from whatever the other they think the other is, whatever they think that is. And we've well, heard that story. I've heard the story of the black man, like that's ridiculous, obviously, but I think in a collection, it really, really emphasizes that because you have one story next to another, next to another, and one voice and another voice and contradicting voices. There's the, the um, possibility of just really quickly and succinctly dispelling that because, you know, surprise, it's all my imagination. I'm just one yeah. person and there's, you know, so many other voices out there. Yeah, they has the possibility of like a, a multiplicity of perspectives compared to the novel, which is sort of more monofocused, some traditionally. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your um, writing habits, Jocelyn? Yeah, of course. Um, what are my writing habits? Well, when I was writing this collection, I was teaching full time. So I really tried to write in the summer, um, in the summers. Uh, but now I really do try to write in the mornings before, and I, I the reason I look like this is because I'm failing right now. I'm telling you this, but I'm not actually doing it right now. I have a fantasy. I had a, someone, I think, told me this, like a writer was like, yeah, I write, I mean, I don't get up at five. I'm not gonna even pretend, I'm, that's just not me. But, but even writing, like after I drop my teen off at high school, he drives me now. And then even between that and like lunch, just having this chunk of time, it is helpful to do it before I think about social media, before I open my emails and worry about what's happening. I find that the world can really pull you away and having some like kind of a dedicated space where that can be helpful. But I think the truth is going to be for me, even now that I'm not teaching full time, is that I'm going to create these moments and pockets and I'm going to go to hopefully back to Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and have a week there. And I'm gonna like rent another weird Hobbit tree house off Airbnb and go there for four days away from my terrible dogs that bark all the time. It's like, I think I'm gonna be a writer in fits and starts even now, at least for now, because life is so um, distracting and I like that. And I'm gonna try, I'm trying to figure out a way to make that work for me. Cause I think there's something interesting about life intruding but I do think you need space and time. Um, I don't know, Ricardo, what about you? Do you have that experience? I mean, do no. It? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. It's like the fantasies kill me, um, you know, but no, I mean, I'm teaching, um, um, you know, full-time and, 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 and so it's, it's tough to cobble together time. I mean, summers are super valuable for me. Breaks are super valuable to me. Um, I find myself note-taking a lot during the year um but yeah no it's it's you know with two kids i mean life is life um but i think for me i never um i kind of just accepted that from the beginning of like i'm i'm not the bookie i'm not the spike lee of of <laughs> of writing i'm not the book a year guy and that's just and i like stewing on things and i like reworking things and i love the process of revision and so that kind of stuff is a lens to the fits and starts, but you know, it's, it's a, always the trick for me is in those free moments to kind of be able to ramp up that discipline um, is always the trick, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I won't ask details, but are you excited about something spilling forth? I am. I am. I am excited. Um, I am excited about something. I have like a couple 
I have one thing I'm working on and then I have all these ideas. I'm, I've been so busy lately and I do think that when I'm very busy, I actually get my best ideas. Mm-hmm. When I can't write, I have this tension and I'm like, but it's like this feeling of like, oh, well, this could happen or maybe this will work. I'll start to come up with solutions. And when I, I love revision too. I love that you said that. And I, when I, when I get into a project and when I'm interested in it, I'm kind of constantly thinking of it and everything that's happening in my life is folding into the work. So like if I got into a fender bender, which luckily I haven't, but if I did like, Knock on wood. maybe my character wouldn't get into a fender bender, but that idea of something being so surprisingly jolting, that's mundane, but also terrifying, or that makes like some of the feelings I have about being a, in a fender bender are absolutely going to show up in this. So it almost feels like just luck, whatever ends up happening to me while I'm working on something really affects like the tone and the like the rhythm of that thing and I do send myself emails and think of sentences in the middle of the night and to try to type them in without my glasses on and then it looks insane and it doesn't make any kind of sense in the morning you know like yeah. I email myself um when I was writing my Monticello I uh was teaching full-time and my last name is Johnson and I was teaching at a school called Johnson Elementary And so if I put in Johnson, sometimes it would go to all staff, (laughs) the entire staff of my school. And I'm writing like a dystopian race war book. And I'm like sending like a sentence that goes to my whole, like there were a couple close claws. Luckily, I don't know what they would have thought of me, honestly. Luckily, nothing too bad went out, but I did have some weird luckily my gobbledygook made it unintelligible and I just wrote an apology and it was all good but that's funny I learned a lesson you shouldn't uh you shouldn't all send to your staff a sentence from your from your dystopian uh book about Sally Hemings and Thomas yeah (laughs) yeah I try to be responsible with my electronics and so I'll try not to sleep with my phone but it just turns out to like if we're watching tv I'll be like beg my wife to text something or i'll sneak and grab her phone in the middle of the night and she'll wake up in the morning and be like what is going on here <laughs> no it's a tip you're much harder yeah. not to have it there but yeah. but i i i admit i have done that <laughs> well uh, jocelyn ricard this has been absolutely yeah. terrific uh i've been so delighted to, to host you both this evening um the book is my monticello you can order it at the link uh here in the chat um thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you, everybody out there. Take care, everyone. Good night.